believe that any intersection between human and machine can be made better when hardware and software are considered and working together. We wanted to give Windows 8 its own companion hardware innovation. It's something new, it's something different, it's a whole new family of computing devices from Microsoft. This is the new Microsoft Surface. If you think you know this story, think again. This is a story that you haven't heard before. It's a tale of top secret prototypes, failed experiments, billion dollar bets, and it's told in part by members of the team that turned the Surface line from rumor to reality. This is the inside story of the Microsoft Surface and how a duo of devices totally changed the computing world. So most people think this story starts about 10 years ago at that iconic event in Los Angeles, but the Surface did not start there. It actually begins a few hundred miles away and about two decades earlier. There may be a recession going on out there somewhere, but you certainly couldn't tell here in Las Vegas as over 2,000 exhibitors, more than 140,000 attendees are here at a bigger than ever fall Comdex. Before there was CES, there was Comdex. It's a show where exhibitors and attendees would mingle and marvel over a sea of essentially beige boxes that filled the exhibit floor for as far as the eye could see. And in 1990, Microsoft would deliver a presentation that the world would not forget. So in his keynote, Bill Gates shared his view of the tech industry as it ascended into a brand new era. And while the presentation seems so simple by today's standards, remember back then, this tech seemed straight out of a sci-fi movie. And there's one concept in particular that got the crowd very excited, and that was this. It will take a little change in the hardware. We'll take a computer like this that has no keyboard. In fact, on the screen, there's a touch-sensitive panel. So as you use a stylus and write, it recognizes gestures you're giving as commands. It wasn't even called a tablet, just a, a mobile computer without a keyboard. Bill demoed features like handwriting recognition, touted the power of a full PC experience on the go, even stressed the importance of a digital pen. The products and software shown off at that demo quickly became a reality just a few short years later. But in 1995, when Bill took the Comdex stage once again, he mentioned one product in particular that was still a bit ahead of its time. One notable thing I had in there that has not taken place is that uh, I was showing the use of pin computing, a tablet computer where the signature was being uh, put in and, and the notes were being recognized. Uh, I still believe very much that that will happen and will be important, uh, but that's one case where the, uh, the time frame uh, wasn't exactly right. Just six years later, the era of the tablet and the handheld PC was really beginning to gain momentum. Several devices of all shapes and sizes lined the presentation table on stage at Comdex 2001, and Microsoft was aggressively developing their pocket PC software. But as Windows experience evolved through the mid 2000s, it was clear that something was missing. So the company had built both a war chest and an empire developing software, but to really showcase the power of Windows and give manufacturers sort of a benchmark to try to aspire to, it was clear they needed to design and develop a device that could run Windows as perfectly as they had envisioned it originally. Now, having said all of that, it was pretty convenient Microsoft was already doing exactly that, and their flagship PC, kind of in a sense, had been hiding in plain sight for years. It just didn't look like this. Instead, it looked like this. It's not like an industry secret, but I think most consumers don't know that Microsoft has actually been in the hardware business for years. They've made keyboards, they've made mice, webcams, and these devices were used by millions of people around the world. But it wasn't until the mid 2000s that they had their most successful venture in their hardware space, and it was, it was Xbox. In hindsight, unsurprisingly, I think the Xbox proved to Microsoft that vertical integration, controlling software and hardware uh, was important. It could deliver an awesome experience that was possible by only having full control over everything. 
and bringing this concept to the PC realm could allow Microsoft to develop a Windows experience that was truly unlike anything else on the market. So that's what they set out to do. It would be a few years later when things got really top secret. There was a meeting of select members of the media and Microsoft unveiled a brand new device that was offering a new, never before seen Windows experience. And the product had a simple name. I'm guessing you can guess what it is, but eloquently described its purpose. It was called, type it down below, the Microsoft Surface. All right, so this is Microsoft Surface, and what it allows us to do is to bring an ordinary tabletop to life. Uh, as you can see, I can reach out and just physically touch digital content with my hands. So when you think of the Microsoft Surface, you were probably thinking about some talk about this. We're gonna get there, but we gotta start this conversation at a coffee table. Now again, we're looking back the benefit of today's time, but back then, we didn't see anything like this before. It was awesome. It did things we had never seen a computer do, and the Surface Table was the company's first real big attempt to transform the PC experience. They were trying to show the magic that could be done when Microsoft Windows software was combined with very special, I think very niche, hardware as well. Surface Table uh, came out from a project we called Playtable, and I started that project in 2003. And it was really at a time when multi-touch wasn't really around. This idea of interacting with a computer should just touch gestures and this kind of, it was it was the first mixed reality table in, in a lot of ways. The idea of service computing was that one day all surfaces, and this is very early on, remember 2002, 2003, all surfaces were going to be intelligent and interactive. And the original surface table could have completely transformed the PC industry. But there was a problem with it. Whole industry was changing. By the late 2000s, tech was shifting from giant, large scales to, you know, what's going on in our pockets. Probably not a surprise to you, but the rise of the smartphone transformed the entire world. And by 2010, tech giants like Apple and Google were controlling pretty much every smartphone software. Microsoft had tried with Windows Mobile and then later with Windows Phone, the lack of app support limited the traction they could get in our pockets. Having missed out on smartphones, Microsoft clearly did not want to miss out on the next big craze, and that was going to be tablets. And if you remember back in 2012, the knock on tablets at the time was, they were just really big phones. Apple was still relatively new with the iPad. Android was still not a tablet solution, just blown up phone software and apps. So Microsoft was like, boom, our shot, our opportunity to show something new here. And going back to that air hockey playing coffee table sized PC, it was aiming to revolutionize a personal computer as we knew it, and it was only fitting the company's newest creation would carry on its legacy, both in mission and in a name when that empowered users to bring their passion's creativity directly to the Surface. This was built as a stage for Windows 8. That was part of our core vision for the product. It was very important for us that we had the hardware fade to the background for this product. It was important so the Windows software could rise to the surface. So fast forwarding a little bit, uh, in June of 2012, uh, Microsoft officially took the wraps off their latest top secret product. It was a duo of devices that marked Microsoft's entrance into the tablet space with a vengeance. The Surface name was brought back to life in the form of two products, the Surface and the Surface Pro, both of which are designed and developed by Microsoft from the inside out. And for the first time in its history, Microsoft was building its own real computer. There were two webcams, uh, a really carefully curated collection of ports and a created kickstand. All that was wrapped in a really super sleek vapor mag casing that was doubled as a stylish protective housing for just the custom hardware that was under the surface. Sorry, it's my last surface panel put in this video. Now a fun personal story, I was at that event and I remember being there looking at these devices. Now we couldn't touch them, we could just look at them from afar and thinking that this is gonna be something. And that was a very clear thought I mentioned in the video the same thought I had when I saw that was it's not ready yet, but you could see like the seeds planted and you could see what Microsoft was trying to do. That if they could stick with and could commit to generations two or maybe three or four would be the one device that might be perfect 
for everybody. So the original October 26, 2012 announce of Surface, I don't know if you remember, that room was packed. The morning before, it was that same moment where like, we're putting everything out, like, you know what, I'm dropping the device on stage. And they're like, no, no, P, you can't. I'm like, we did so much engineering on this product, people need to know I'm gonna drop this thing. And I remember like telling the team, ah, I won't drop it, it's fine. And then I'm in the middle of the presentation and the crowd is so excited. I'm like, well, you got to see what this thing really does. And VaporMag coming together and every component designed perfectly within this device to make sure it's not busting. I can drop it again if you want. Check this out. It's still working. There's not even a debate that it wouldn't. How many people drop a machine on stage? Have you ever seen that before? Yeah. I want you to know that everybody told me not to do that, but I got to tell you, it's not going to break. And, I, and that was the sort of, that was like the summary of who the Surface team was. Like, go ahead and take a risk. And, and then at some point, it's a lot more calculated than everybody thinks. And while this story on its own is fascinating, there's another story within this story of how the team that built the Surface was formed. So Microsoft was pulling people from all other hardware groups, like accessories division, to work on this brand new device. And they were tasked to build these devices and turn this just not so concept into something that could actually work. Like we couldn't tell our family members at home what we were doing. We were going in and out of buildings at Microsoft, not being able to tell other folks what we were doing. The building that we were in was so locked down. Like not only were we not allowed to tell our families, like everything was locked down. And like we had problems getting the garbage emptied because nobody could get into the room to actually empty right. the garbage. And so we had all of these, you know, procedures for making sure because, you know, we were working 24 yeah. hours a day. But I agree like this. The secrecy was the hardest part. And if Microsoft could do it right, if they could get these things to actually work, they could transform the software giant into a hardware giant and possibly change the PC computing world at the time. What's up everyone, John Rettinger from Techno Buffalo here, excitedly ready to unbox the Microsoft Surface with Windows RT. Both the Surface and Surface Pro made their debut. And their launch, listen, let's be honest, is met with excitement for what it could be, enthusiasm for the aesthetics, but also there was like a lot of confusion, like eyebrow raised. Uh, both tablets kind of looked the same and they shared the same DNA. They were offering two very different functionally Windows experiences. The non-pro Surface, often called Surface RT, was running, you guessed it, Windows RT. It was a version of Windows 8 built for ARM processors, which could not run all typical Windows apps most PCs were able to. Most importantly, the Windows apps people were used to being able to run. The Surface Pro got a much higher spec. It was an Intel-based Core i5 processor that could run full-blown Windows 8, run full-blown Windows 8 apps. So we've got the benefit of hindsight now, but uh, launching two products that were fragmented, one that couldn't do as much as the other one and couldn't do what most people were used to, but looked identical, it caused some confusion. And I think that left a lot of people thinking, good hardware, I'm not using that, I don't know what it's for. Uh, Microsoft had announced quarterly earnings, as publicly traded companies do, and it was revealed they took a, if you had 900 million on your lost bingo card, you would win. That's what they took on the Surface RT. Now at this point, I don't think anybody would have faulted Microsoft for being like, our bad, we're gonna take that loss and we're gonna move on to something different. But the message from Microsoft was very, very, very surprising. That they were still 100% committed to the Surface and Windows RT but many in the tech space, including really me, was pretty skeptical of the future. I remember the day after the write down, remember everything was still secret. Even within our own team, we didn't talk about financials. There was no public knowledge of any of it until that day of earnings. We sat in our lab, we were all there. And you know, you're a team and you believe in each other. You believe like in your soul what you're doing and you have a path. It was you know, Microsoft's leadership that gave me the confidence and then it was our team that gave me the belief, if that makes sense. And you know, we all had that meeting, we took a step forward and said, don't look back, it's okay. Here's what we learned and we have a plan. The plan doesn't change, let's go. We ultimately got the answer that the Surface was here to stay. Let me introduce you, Surface Pro 2. <laughs> so it took about a year and a half from the first Surface announcement 
to us getting the second generation. And I'm gonna surprise you here, they were refined versions of their predecessors, packed with updated hardware and software experiences. Both shared the now iconic surface design, that really awesome kickstand with lapability, uh, but featured a notable upgrades to the main components, things that mattered. Things like display, hinge, and battery. And Panay went to make it very clear Microsoft wanted to best serve its customers. And one way which they could do that was listening to feedback and making improvements. So the first few years of the Surface lives were, like, it wasn't smooth. Uh, and Microsoft did admit, though, that it was crucial to its ultimate success. It gave consumers the opportunity to learn and kind of poke around at Surface devices for the very first time. And I think it helped make them aware Microsoft was more than a software company. They were building devices to help consumers work and play not only better, but very, very differently than they had before. And it did, it kind of crescendoed, I think, when the third generation Surface device was launched. And this was the one that cracked the code and finally became the one Surface device that got it right and just did it all. When we shipped the first product, we were already working on version three. We, when we shipped the product, version two was almost ready. Right. We knew, for example, if you take the kickstand on the original Surface, it has one position. We understood that it needed to have a continuous hinge, but the development timeline to develop this hinge took so long, took much longer than a regular product or processor mm -hmm. cycle, right? And so I like to describe it as we knew we, when we, we knew the ingredients when we shipped the first one, but we didn't really have the proportions right. This got us on the map. Now we have a, now we are, re that was the tipping point from a startup to a real business. They got on stage, puffed up their chests, and said the Surface 3 line was a definitive tablet that could replace your laptop, due in part to one gigantic upgrade. Both third gen Surface devices were now running full-blown Windows. So they could run full Windows apps. They didn't have to deal with any RT limitations. Consumers could now pick the lower powered or the high powered one, but at least they knew it would run all of their apps. By the mid 2010s, it became very clear the line had matured into increasingly compelling offering that was getting serious momentum. So it seemed very clear at this point that three times was the charm for Microsoft, but their luck didn't end there. Let's time machine back to the fall of 2015, following the announcement of, guess what came after the Surface Pro 3? Surface Pro 4. Uh, Panos Panay was excited to sort of wrap up the presentation, and he could have ended it there. But we had sort of our one more thing moment when he asked a question. You guys wanna talk about another product? Yeah! What if you've wanted a Surface? but you wanted a laptop surface. We made the ultimate laptop. We made Surface Book. So this was the Surface Book. It was built as the ultimate laptop. It was just packed with kind of everything Microsoft could do. There was a machined magnesium body that felt premium, had a high res 13 inch display, glass trackpad and keyboard, which I think is still amongst the best keyboards ever in a laptop. All of that was coupled with Intel Skylake processor under the hood, and it was actually powerful. But there had another surprise, which I don't think anybody saw coming. The Surface Book had one more trick up its sleeve. You could take off the screen and use it as its own tablet, almost like its own Surface computer. But that was crazy cool. We hadn't really seen anything like that yet, uh, and that made a lot of people very excited for the Surface Book. I remember actually going to CES later that year and using the Surface Book as my own computer. And sort of people were shocked when I would take off the screen, flip it around, put it back uh, in the base. That was something very new. And in a world of sameness and copycats, something that's different still stands out in my memory. So the Surface Book, while also being just a cool thing, the announcement marked Microsoft's entrance to yet another big hardware category, but also grew the Surface line now uh, beyond just tablets. It was a moment that proved Microsoft was full on committed to not just the Surface line, but I guess now the new Surface brand. We tried to make other devices that could do something new and different. So that led them to the next expansion in the Surface family. They were gonna try to change the desktop world. Enter this guy. Dubbed the Surface Studio, the device extended the Surface's touch capabilities into a 
really good looking, Jimungus at the time, 28 inch high res display that functions like a canvas more than it did a monitor. Remember it could, it could do this. It had a universal hinge that could go all the way down to almost for drafting. And it wasn't a traditional all-in-one PC with like a big chin. All the components were kind of down below and made the monitor display look like it was floating. Making all that happen was a zero gravity hinge. It allowed the display to go from an upright position down to that angled drafting position like I just said in a matter of seconds with the pull of the display. The Surface Studio, and I'm sorry, I apologize in advance, figuratively and literally flex to the will of the artist behind the canvas. We hadn't seen a PC on the market like this. I think it broke the rules in all the right ways. And a lot like, it seems like my waistline the past few years, the Surface line was expanding like crazy. They had gone to the accessory side as well. They upgraded type covers to pens, dials, even headphones and earbuds. Surface products were now becoming very versatile. Between new hardware, like the Surface Go, Surface Pro X, and continued updates to products like Surface Pro, Surface Laptop, Surface Book, Microsoft was pushing the envelope on what Windows hardware and software experience could be and should be on a pretty much yearly basis. And all of that sort of leads us to this. Microsoft just took the wraps off the Surface Pro 9, a pretty worthy successor to the widely popular Surface Pro 8, got a really nice looking 13 inch pixel sense display, 120 Hertz. That's going to make everything you do on this canvas buttery smooth. You've also got your choice of pretty powerful silicon under the hood. You can option the Surface Pro 9 with either a 12th gen Intel processor with support for Thunderbolt 4 or go with Microsoft's SQ3 with crazy speedy 5G. There's also the Surface Laptop 5, the latest addition to the Surface Laptop line. Uh, it's packing a pretty big punch with sleek looks and an insane amount of power. You're also getting at this point, the iconic look. Uh, the ultra premium surface design. You could pick different sizes too. There's a 13.2 or 15 inch, three by two pixel sense display and speakers capable of Dolby Atmos. Microsoft has not only changed the tablet industry, but they've transformed the laptop space too, making the Surface Laptop 5 one of the best options on the market. And if you know anything about, you know, jobs and tech companies, uh, people don't stay where they are very long. Leaders tend to leave, employees tend to look for greener pastures. What was surprising about the team behind the surface was they stayed together, but also they expanded more and more. Each year they got bigger. There were more designers, more engineers, more developers. But that same like core ethos of the project and much of the leadership team directing the project remained consistent since day one. It's really special that a V1 team is still intact and together. What has kind of kept us also together is that we all uh, first trust each other and we also recognize that we're pretty kick-ass and we adapt to more challenges and whatever gets thrown at us and that's actually happening as every year goes by and and uh, we will continue, I think, uh, you know, kicking ass for, for quite some time. So if I can hop out of my time machine, sit us back here at the end of 2022, what you have in your backpack and what you've got in your pocket is nothing short of amazing. But to get us to that point, there had to be iterations. There had to be missteps, mistakes that taught us something new. And I'll argue that no device in the PC world has gotten us closer to the perfect laptop or tablet form factor than the Surface has over the past 10 years. And to look back at the original Comdex speech when Bill Gates laid out a plan, that seemed like science fiction. But if technology's progress is how does anything, it's that sometimes that science fiction leads to fact and the real products are just below the surface.